Alhamdulillah, we're back on uh, camera, and I take again the opportunity to thank uh, you for coming out. I thank you for your patience. We're sorry for the delays that we're having, but we hope it will be fruitful in the end product, inshallah, that you'll be able to have copies of this tape and have it in your library to share with others to discuss. So I thank you once more for your patience. Let's continue. I kind of ended up on the last note, uh, uh, running something to you. Maybe I, you I don't know if you did or not, but we were talking about Jesus' scripture. The scripture, Luke chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. Jesus is Lord. Let's see what that means in this scripture here. And when the child, Jesus, when he was eight days old, and when the accomplished was, uh, the, the days of accomplishment of the circumcision of the child, the child was named Jesus. And when the child, when the days of, the, uh, of her, meaning Mary's purification according to the law of Moses, was accomplished, they, Mary and Joseph, brought him, Jesus, peace be upon him, to Jerusalem. They brought the child when he was eight days old, and then they had purified themselves. They brought him to the temple in Jerusalem to do what? To present him to the Lord. So my question is, if they're bringing Jesus at eight days old after having been circumcised to the temple to present him to the Lord, then evidently he himself cannot be the Lord God. So this term would ev evidently mean Lord, meaning rabbi, meaning master or teacher. So I just want to point to that. But Jesus is not the Lord God. He's not God. Finally, on this topic in John chapter 20 verse 17 John chapter 20 verse 17 Jesus said unto her Mary Magdalene touch me not for I'm not yet ascended unto my father but go unto my brethren and say unto them I ascend unto my father and your father we both father go tell them I ascend to my father and your father to my God and your God I'm sending to my God and your God the question is who is Jesus' God? He has a God that he's ascending to. Who is that God? It's the same God that is my God that is your God. It's the same Father that is my Father and your Father. We all have the same God. We all have the same Father. I don't know if I forgot to quote to you John chapter 17, verse 3, where Jesus said, uh, This is life eternal, that they may know thee, only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou have sent. So therefore we say that Jesus is not God according to Jesus himself. What about Paul's concept of God? Paul, what did he say about God? I mean about Jesus rather. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5, Paul says there, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men who anthropos, the man Christ Jesus. And the question we ask, who is this one God that Paul refers to? The answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. But for us, there is one God. Who? The Father. Not the Son, not the Holy Ghost. The Father. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, Paul says that the God of our Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may he give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the God of him. So now we have this guy, this idea of Lord here, satisfied that it's not God. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, 14, Paul says there, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not bowing my knees to Jesus. I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm prostrating to. Addressing uh, the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 23, Paul says that ye are Christ and Christ is God. You are Christ and Christ belong to God. To make it more clearer, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul says there, but I would have you know that the head of every man, the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. This is the way the system goes. The head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28, Paul says, talking about the end of time now, when all things shall be subdued unto him, meaning God, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him to put all things under him, that God may be all in all. God doesn't need any company then on that day. That God may be all in all by himself. What about the deity of, uh, of God and Jesus according to Peter? In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, you know, many times our Christian brethren, they say, what do you believe about Jesus? We said we believe that he was a righteous and noble prophet of God, a messenger of God, uh, along with the many other prophets that God had uh, sent to humanity. They said, you believe he's only a prophet or... This way, see, this is the problem. You believe he's only a prophet. I said, well, this is what Jesus said about himself. He says, this is life eternal to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou have sent. One who is sent by God is the messenger of God. And he says, he who is sent is not greater than he who sent him. But here Peter says, in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, he knows. He should know who Jesus is. You remember the time when Jesus asked Peter, said, who, who, men that say, who the men say that I am? And Jesus said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Bar Jonas, for flesh and blood didn't tell you that. In other words, you got a revelation from God to tell you who I am. So we said, well, Peter should know then. So let's ask him here. Now Jesus has come and he's gone. And so now since he's gone, let's ask Peter, who was that man? You know, like those of us who can remember the old Western, the Long Ranger, when he ride away, the people say, who was that masked man, you know, who did all these nice things? Who was that masked man? So we asked Peter, who was that man, Jesus? Acts chapter 2, verse 22 says, ye men of Israel, this is the first time he's addressing the people now after the days of Pentecost, uh, after they had been endued with the Holy Ghost. So now he's addressing the Jews. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Listen to me carefully. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. Not Bethlehem like you see now in the uh, portraits that we have out here for Christmas now, the child in the manger, born in the manger, not that. He's not of Bethlehem. He's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's called a Nazarene, the Nasara, the Christian. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. This is who he is. A man approved of God, a man appointed by God by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves already know. I'm just reminding you. You already know. He's a man appointed by God by miracles and wonders and signs that he did. God did them by him. He didn't do them of his own. He says, I of my own self can do nothing in the midst of you, as you already know. So according to Peter, Jesus was only a prophet a messenger of God. What about this concept, Son of God, that we talked about? John chapter 3, verse six, 16. Son of God. And where did uh, 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 this concept come from? So now Jesus himself explains what he means when he uses the term Son of God. And many of our Christian brothers quote to us, John chapter 10, verse 30. I am my Father one. I am my father of one. But I asked him, I said, well, look, have you ever considered to uh, quote that scripture from the version known as the Eastern, Eastern uh, version of the Bible, translated basically from Aramaic, which was the mother tongue of Jesus, Aramaic. And there, when you read in this Bible, translated from Jesus' language, which, by the way, when you speak of the name God, God, we say, what did Jesus call God? In Aramaic, which is the script here, it says Aramaic names and their uh, English names and their Aramaic equivalent. God, Allah. God, Jesus, Allah. This is what he called God. Allah. Allah. Not Jehovah, not Elohim, not Yahweh, not Adonai, but Allah. Allah, Allah, Lama Shabbatani. Allah, this is it here. Meanwhile, here in John chapter 10, verse 30, 
What does it say? I and my father are of one accord. Not one in nature, not one in, 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 in essence, but one in purpose. But let's look and see what Jesus says about this oneness. And we began with this topic here, I and my father are one. That's the text. We said, well, look, read the context there and we'll see what this text is about. That's the verses that be, go before and after it. So we begin in John chapter 10, uh, 10, verse 23. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews came around about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Stop beating around the bush now. This has been long enough. It's gone on long enough. If you are the Messiah, the Messiah, the Christ, tell us plainly in plain words so we can know. Jesus answered them, I told you. I already told you but you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. In other words, now, if you won't believe what I said and what I told you, look at what I do. My actions speak louder than words. But ye believe not, because you're not of my sheep. And I say, as I said unto you, this is why you don't believe. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Then he goes on, that's about me. Now he goes on to say, my father, which gave them me, gave them to me, is greater than all. It's greater than me, you, and anybody. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. In that sense, he says the next verse, I and my father are one. I and my father are one in purpose in keeping the sheep together. Now, the, the conversation goes on. Then the Jews took up stones, in verse 31 of John chapter 10, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus said, wait a minute, hold it. He didn't really say that, but I'm just saying. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father, but which of the works are you stoning me? What, I mean, what's going on? I showed you all these good works. Which one of those good works are you stoning me for? Because I haven't done anything bad. The Jews answered and said, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blaspheming. This is why we're going to stone you. Because thou being a man, Anthropos, making yourself God. You're making yourself God because you say, I am my father. And so our Christian brothers say, you see, that's why they want to stone him because they understood him to claim that he's God. We said, no, they misunderstood to claim he's God. They misunderstood him, not they understood him. And he shows them the misunderstanding now. Look, Jesus answered them and said, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? And that's in Psalms chapter 86, uh, I think it's verse 2. Psalms 86, 2. Is it written in your law, I say, ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of whom, whom the Father have sanctified and sent into the world, I blaspheme because I said, I am the Son of God. So look how the conversation goes. They asked him, are you the Christ? Tell us plainly. Christ. I'm telling you that Christ and Son of God is the same interchangeable terms, meaning a righteous person. Blessed are the peacemakers, so that, for they shall be called the Son of God, children of God. So he says, I told you, but you didn't believe me. So he says, after he tells them about his, I am my father of one. They wanted to stone him because they thought that he was blaspheming because being a man, now he's equating himself with God. He says, no, it's not like that. He says, look, that's a metaphor. It's a metaphor when you are called gods. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, it says, God says to Moses, you go to Pharaoh. Moses complains that he can't speak too well. He says, no problem. I'll make you a god and he says, well, look, if you're going to make me God, I'm not going to go. I need a prophet. He says, I'll make Aaron a prophet for you. I'll make you a God, and I'll make Aaron a prophet. He's not making him literally, really a God. So Jesus said, isn't it written in your law, I say ye are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. So he says, if, if God called the people that he sent this revelation to gods, and the scripture can't contradict itself, God is not a liar there, so why are you saying that I blaspheme? Because I said something even less. I said, I am the son of God. 
So I asked my Christian brother, I said, where did he claim to be the son of God? He claimed to be the son of God when he said he was the Christ. When he said he was the Messiah, the same term. It's the son of God. This is what he means there. But they being stubborn, they picked up stones to stone him again. So what? He ran away. Is God running away? You know, this is not correct. Again, to show that Christ and the Son of God meant the same thing, look at this. When Jesus asked uh, Peter, who do men say that I am? Three different gospel writers, look what they said about the same statement. According to Luke chapter 22, I mean Mark, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Peter answered, thou art the Christ. That's all. The Christ, meaning you are the Messiah, the Messiah. The anointed one. But Matthew, when he wrote it, he said, Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He added that. Well, it means the same thing. Luke chapter 9, verse 20 answers, have Peter answered, Thou art the Christ of God. You're the Christ of God. The Son of God. It's the same thing. The Christ of God, the Son of God. And if that's not clear enough, look at this. They tell us that the first uh, uh, non-Jew, the first non-believer, rather, who proclaimed Jesus to be the Son of God was the centurion at the cross. When Jesus was dying such a noble death, and the, one of the captives, one of the the, the, the prison guards, he had to bear witness himself. You know, after doing all that torture and one thing after another that he was doing, he had to make a, mis a statement about the nobility of this person here. He says there in, in Mark chapter 15, verse 39, he says, and when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly this man was the son of God. This is what he said. Truly this man was the Son of God. That's according to Mark chapter 15. But the same statement coming from the same individual written by Luke and Luke chapter 23 verse 47 says, Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. It's the same thing. Surely this was the Son of God. Surely this one writer said Surely it was a right of man, right, uh, righteous man. Somebody said, excuse me, it's the Son of God. And he said, ah, it means the same thing. It's the same thing. It means the same thing. It's no problem. He said, oh, okay, we, we understand. Even, well, okay, we'll leave that. Let's move on. Let's look at another topic. We're running out of time. <laughs> I don't want to belabor this too long. Uh, was Christ killed or crucified? Let's touch on that a, a few minutes. And this is not something, again, just a correction on that uh, Psalms, was Psalms chapter 82, verse 6, where Jesus said, isn't it written in your law, I say your God? Psalms chapter 82, verse 6, in case somebody looks at the table and says, this guy is quoting something, it's not even there. <laughs> Shukran. Uh, in Newsweek, saw this article here. The death of Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus Christ. New insights, new insights on his last days. People are constantly probing and looking at these things now. You know, the, almost the whole of Europe now, only 3% the, the of Europe is really attending church these days. They're falling away from this Christian concept of God, some God, he died for your sins and all that. The, the European people now are just leaving that. It's just basically the the, the the bedrock is right here in this country here in the United States now, and that's waning, waning. Now, we have a book here, New Discovery, World Discovery. Christ did not perish on the, Christ, on the cross. Christ's body buried alive. And this writer here is given scientific and factual evidence as he sees it uh, to this effect. We're not going to rely on them. As I said before, we want to look uh, in the text itself. 
and the Plain Truth magazine, they did something called To Know Christ and Him Crucified. This is a statement by, by Paul. Paul says, I determined to know, not to know anything among you save Christ and Him Crucified. I don't want to know if you want to tell me about the historical Jesus. Look, I don't have time for that. Don't bother me. Did he die? Yes, that's all I'm interested in. I'm not interested in nothing else. Don't tell me about the miracles he did and who he came to and where he lived and what he ate. I'm not interested in that. So to know Christ and his crucified, many Christians don't know that Jesus didn't teach any doctrine of original sin. They don't know that. They don't know that Jesus never mentioned anything about the curse and the fall of man. Jesus never taught any redemption from a curse. Jesus taught that salvation was not through grace, but through that you had to be earned, and he never abolished any law. So if you're only interested in knowing Christ and him crucified, you miss many of these other things. But in the Quran, the Quran speaks about this subject. Allah says in the Quran, وَكَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّ كَتَالْنَا مَسِيحَا إِسَى بْنَ مَرَيَامَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَمَا كَتَلُوهُ وَمَا سَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِي حَالَهُمْ that they Jews, in the, these are the people I keep in mind that Allah is indicting the Jews that they boasted and they said, we have killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. And they killed him not, nor did they crucify him. They didn't kill him. They didn't crucify him. Two kinds of death Allah is rejected. Cut killing by death and manner and salabu or crucifixion by a specific manner. And this is why we have the words headed like that because if I say, well, this is talking about, he says, was Christ killed or crucified to death? He doesn't know what he's talking about. Was Christ crucified to death? So we're saying that because Allah is pointing to here that they killed him not because this was one verdict that was rendered in the Bible and later on changed to crucifixion. So now we discover this here, they crucified him not. But it was only made to appear to them as such. And the people who hold these doctrines, these views, have no certain knowledge about it, only conjecture, for of a certainty they did not kill him. So now from the outset, I am saying as a Muslim that what the Quran is rejecting here is not any concept that Jesus was ever tortured or that he was ever put through any trial such as this uh, alleged crucifixion. No, the Quran is not addressing that issue. The Quran is saying that the finality of anything concerning Jesus was not in someone having killed him or crucified him, that he didn't die as a result of whatever might have been the situation. First of all, let's define what we mean by crucifixion. By crucifixion, crucifixion does not mean died unless proof is attained, obtained that the person is actually dead. You see, like two presidents were shot. Uh, Ronald Reagan was shot and uh, J John F. Kennedy was shot. The difference is one was shot to death and one was attempted murder. In other words, one was murdered or slain murdered, and one was attempted murder. Attempted murder. So if a person is crucified, that person has to be pronounced dead by a competent person able to pronounce that a person is dead. You can't see and look and assume that a person is dead. Many times you people have been pronounced dead even in our own times and they come and revive them later on and said, no, that person was near death, but they hadn't really died. So they brought him back to life. People speak about this all the time. We said, no, you had not really died. Once you die, there's a barrier, a barrier between this life and the next, and no one comes back. So we mean that death does not mean dead unless proof, proof is obtained that the person is actually dead. And here's an article that I read concerning a little girl who had been considered clinically dead for quite a, a period of time, some minutes, like maybe 10, 15 minutes is involved here, and yet revived nice and healthy and running around now. So, there's a lot of different ways now we can uh, 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 approach this topic to prove that Jesus, peace be upon him, was not crucified. 
was not killed, uh, didn't die for anybody's sins. Uh, different ways that we can approach it. You know, the whole story of Jesus, uh, God incarnating, is only due to the biblical story of the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. What happened in the Garden of Eden, where that the devil, uh, in the form of a snake, Satan, uh, tempted Eve and made her sin, according to the Bible, and she's the one responsible for woman's sin, but not man, uh, where in the Quran alleviates, uh, uh, accuses them both of wrongdoing and then forgives them. The Bible keeps forever that sin, that curse, that wrongdoing on woman until this very day. However, uh, because of that situation, they say that man now has fallen from the grace of God and that now his progeny forever inherited the ability uh, to sin. Not the Christians are getting wise now. They're not saying inherit the sin, but they inherited the ability to sin. They're trying to change up a little bit. And so that therefore that that sin is of such a nature that God cannot forgive it and that only some uh, uh, sacrifice beyond man's ability to, to uh, make has to be an atoning reconciliation for that situation. So that therefore God the Father became God the Son and dwelled among the people and died for the sins of mankind. So all we have to do is prove that story to be wrong. Prove that story to be wrong that God forgives sins without uh, uh, people, ha someone having to die, and that could be re rule out the necessity for this incarnation and the crucifixion, the whole business. Uh, we can talk about what is the nature of resurrection. If a person dies and, ra and, and rises from the dead, what kind of body should that person have? So if it should be a spiritual body or a physical body. So if you say spiritual body, which in fact it would have to be, then we can prove that Jesus didn't have that body when he rose from the dead accordingly. So therefore he was not resurrected from dead, evidently resuscitated. We can attack it that way. Or we can show that Jesus himself prophesied that he wouldn't die. And John, in Matthew chapter 12, around verse 49, where Jesus compared himself, made a sign for himself, comparing himself with Jonah. So we can see the, what was the nature of that sign. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of earth. We can show whether Jonas was alive or dead when he was in the earth, in the fish, and it, was that comparable? Or was it the time factor involved there? Was it three days and three nights? We said, no, it was only two nights in one day. That wasn't the factor. We can show many things about that to show that that wasn't the case. And so Jesus prophesied he would be saved as he prayed in the garden not to die. He says, oh, my father, if it be possible, take this cup away from me. I don't want it. I didn't come to die. Nevertheless, not as I will. Being a Muslim, he submits his will to the will of God. If this is what you will, do it. But me, I don't want it. I'm not here for that. I didn't come to die for anybody's sin. So take this cup away from me. And Mark, he says, all things are possible to you. Never mind if it be possible. He says, all things are possible. Take this cup away from me. Look, get rid of it. And then on the cross, he's been promised. The angel comes to strengthen him. So he's promised that God will save him. So he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You only say that when you have a commitment for somebody uh, uh, to the, just the opposite. You know, if the brother says, look, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to meet you on the corner of, uh, of uh, a certain place at a certain time. I want you to be there. And then when I come and I'm standing there an hour, two hours, or half an hour, four, uh, whatever, and the person is not there, I get on the phone, I call the house, and he's watching the fight. I said, come on, man, why'd you stand me up? You had me standing out here in the cold, it's raining and all that? He says, I didn't think it was going to come, so I just thought I'd watch the fight. I said, nah, well, you had a commitment. You should have been there. So Jesus says, why have you forsaken me? You promised not to let this happen just before it happens. You know, at the end of the time, the guy's on death row. He says, look, they're going to execute me. I thought you were going to get me out of this. He says, the lawyer comes and says, don't worry. We've got the governor on the line now. He's getting ready to give you something. Just, just relax. Because I'm saying, what's going on? It's getting close to the hour. So we can show that Jesus had been promised not to die. We can look at the situation that way. Or we can look at the first account. The first account about how Jesus left this world was not through crucifixion at all. According to the Acts of the Apostles, that Jesus was put to death by stoning and his dead body was hung on a tree. Now, that sounds strange, but this is one we're going to deal with first. And finally, we can look at the contradictory natures, the contradictory nature of the gospel accounts. 
like some of it we just talked about, whether the stone was moved, it wasn't stone moved, did Judas, Judas kiss him or not. One thing after the other, we can look at all these contradictions and say, look, this story can't be reliable. In the court of law today, they throw it out. But I've been hearing it. The grand jury said, look, they don't even go to trial. Throw it out. The book of, of God, the story there, they said, throw it out. So let me move past some of it. I'm sorry, I have to do this. But no, maybe I won't. Inherited sin. Look, Ezekiel chapter, I'm going to kind of go a little fast. I hope you bear with me. I want to get some of these things in. Time is running out. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. It says there, the soul that sinned, it, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. And in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 6, talking about how you get your sins forgiven or who's punished for what you do. But the children of the murderer, he slew not according to that which was written in the book of the law of Moses, wherein the law commanded Moses, saying, The father shall not be put to death for the son, for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers, but every man shall die and be put to death for his own sin. Nobody can die for your sins. Everybody has to die for his own sin. How are sins forgiven? In 1 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, there it says, If my people... And Farrakhan, I remember he quoted this at the Me and Man March, and a lot of people now have it as bumper stickers because it was made popular there, but they must don't understand what's being said here. It goes against their religion. It says, First Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then shall I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's all. That's all you have to do. Nobody has to come and die for your sins. If you follow my Lord and repent, make Tauba, the day of atonement, make Tauba, repentance, and stop the wrong, then will I hear your prayer. When you pray to me, I'll hear you then, and I'll heal your land, and I'll forgive you your sins. Don't have to worry about it. What about in the Lord's Prayer? Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, and 14 and 15. And forgive us our debts, our sins, as we forgive our debtors, the people who sin against us. This is what we pray to God. Forgive us our sins. How? The same way we forgive the people that, that, that sin against us. You're not going to say you're better than God. If you're able to forgive somebody your sins, what, you think God can't forgive you? you got an attribute better than God now. Says the brother that he can forgive God, sins. God won't do that. You're better than God. You see, no. He says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. For if, you're for, if you forgive not men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. You don't do it, he won't forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, but if you forgive, in other words, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if not, your heavenly Father will, will not forgive your sins. What about the nature of the resurrected body? And here we have in Newsweek, rethinking the resurrection. We have to think about it again. The resurrection. Rethinking it. Rethinking it. So this guy, he keeps all these articles and stuff. <laughs> the resurrected body. What should it be? Spiritual or physical? According to Jesus, peace be upon him, it should be a spiritual body. There, you remember the time when the Jews came to Jesus and they wanted to put a riddle to him to trip him up. And they said, look, they tell us about this story about uh, Moses had called a liberate law of marriage, wherein that a woman, she married a man, and she couldn't give birth to any children through the man, so the man died. So according to the law of Moses, that woman should marry the brother, which again allows polygamy, uh, uh, marry the brother of, uh, that, of, the, of that man and try to have children with him. So they come to Jesus and say, look, this woman had this situation where she had did this seven times. She had been married to seven brothers, and all of them died, and she had no children. So she finally died. On the day of resurrection, who's going to claim her to be the wife? His seven brothers lined up here, and here comes the woman. So who's going to claim her for wife? Luke chapter uh, 20, verse 34, Jesus answers. And Jesus answered and said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain the world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Why? 
because neither can they die anymore. They are equal unto angels. The term is it's angelos, it's spirit beings. They become spirit beings and are children of God being children of the resurrection. They're sons of God because they're children of the resurrection. They're spirit beings now. So they don't have these cardinal desires that you have now. So that problem is resolved there on the day of judgment. They're spirits when they resurrect. Paul goes on to say, he gives a better definition. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 35 and then 42 and 44, he says there, he asks a rhetorical question. He says, but some man will say, somebody might ask you, how are the dead raised and with what body do they come? And he answered, he says, so is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If somebody dies, they die as a physical body a natural body, and when they rise from the dead, they are a spiritual body. So we ask our Christian brethren, as by the way, Peter agreed with that. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, he says there, For Christ has also once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. He was put to death physically, but rose spiritually. So we have that if a person dies and rises from the dead, he dies physically, he rises spiritually. Now, is that the case with Jesus? Was Jesus a spirit? Because our good Christian brethren tell us now that Jesus, when he rose from the dead, they don't like to say spiritual body because they caught with this, so they got a new word that they say that's not in here. They say he had a glorified body. A glorified body. Where did he get that from? What is a glorified body? This is the term that they coined for themselves. They try to ex escape this. But there's the, this hatch is closed. Look. In Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, verses 36, when Jesus now, after the day of crucifixion, and he comes back into that upper room, it says there, and as he thus spoke, as he just spoke, Jesus stood in, as they just spoke, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said unto them, what? Shalom alaikum. Salam alaikum. Peace be upon you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen what? A spirit. Because they assumed to look. They weren't there, but they heard that Jesus had been put to death. News got to them and said, the guy that used to run with you, the, the guy, your leader, he says, man, they killed him the other day on the cross. He said, well, we knew they grabbed him and all that, but we didn't know, we didn't know if he ever got away. Because now nah, they killed him. They crucified him. So they're all sad and in the upper room. So all of a sudden, Jesus comes in and comes into the room. And they look and they're frightened and thinking that he's a spirit because they said he must have died and rose. And if he did, he has to be a spirit. And Jesus said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? What's going on? Why are you looking at me like that? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is who I, who myself, I'm the same person. Handle me and see, for a spirit, indefinite article, any spirit, has no flesh and bones as you see me have. You don't have any flesh and bones. A spirit, no spirit. Handle me and see. You don't see it handled. The Christian brothers, they tell us, well, you know, he didn't have blood. You know, if he says shed his blood on Calvary, this is something that they call an also for themselves. We say we person doesn't, you don't feel a person, handle a person to see if they have blood. You feel the flesh and the bones. You want blood, you take a, 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 a syringe and you draw the blood. But if a person standing alive with flesh and bones and talking and eating and drinking, you know he must have blood. So he says, handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. And Paul helps us there too. He says, because flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So if he said Jesus didn't have blood, he had flesh, and he can't go there with that. He's got that now, so he can't go to heaven now. He's got to be still somewhere in Palestine, walking around over there now, trapped forever. Can't get to heaven, if that's the case. It says, I'm just saying, that's how silly that argument is. That's all. It's not to be funny or make mockery. I'm just saying that's silly. It's such a silly argument. Behold my hands and my feet that desire myself, handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. And when, they th when he thus spoke, spake, he showed them his hands and feet, showing them. And while they yet not believed for joy, they didn't believe. They said, well, we still don't believe. Man, really, is it you? And wondered. He said there, he said, look, you guys need a, a greater test. He says, have you here any meat? Got any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb, and he took it, and what? and ate where before them. It's a demonstration. He's not eating with them. He ate before them to show them something. 
So this gospel writer is showing that Jesus was resuscitated, not resurrected. He's not a resurrected body, disproving it at all. I won't deal with the sign of Jonah. I'll move on to the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus to whom was he sent? In Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, Jesus makes it clear. We don't have to stay too long on that. When he's talking to the Canaanite woman there, she comes to Jesus. She wants to have her daughter healed. And she's not a person of an Israelite distraction. So it says there, she said, oh, oh Jesus, oh, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. He's not even done talk to her. And he tells his disciples, because they had said, look, this woman is crying after us, and she's bothering us. Why don't you just do something for a man and send her away before the whole crowd here? So she says, look, can you help me? He, he answers her not a word. He's not even talking to her. He tells his disciples, says, what do you ask me? Something like that. He says, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, he never, ever changed that statement in his life. I say that because the next statement I'm going to quote to you, they're going to say, well, he changed it later. This one, he never changed. So that's point blank. So that's the end of that one. He says, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, 24, he never changed it. To say, well, you know, later on, I am sent to everybody. No, he never changed it. Now, that's his commission, who God commissioned him to. And... In Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, 6, we have something there called the great, I mean, called, called the uh, limited commission, the commission of the disciples, where Jesus sent them out for the first time and for the only time. Not all of his uh, disciples, disciples mean everybody that's seen Jesus. Apostles are only the 12 that he chose and named them apostles. Any disciples of this people happen to be with Jesus and seen him. You see, as a certain brothers sitting at the table, they could be my companions and my friends. But everybody else, they know me and as my associates. You know, they know me, they see me. These are my friends. So Jesus chose 12 and he named those apostles. Anybody else is a disciple. He didn't send disciples nowhere. He sent his apostles, 12, to each tribe to warn them. And he sent them on a limited commission for a limited period of time. So he says these 12, that these 12, he commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles. Any non-Jewish person, don't go around them. You and I, we're Gentiles. Anybody who's non-Israelite is a Gentile and he's not sent to them. He says, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Somebody else will deal with them. That's not my mission. I'm only do, that's can't you look, man, I'm telling you now. That's all I'm sent to. So he says, go not to the way of the Gentiles or any city of the Samaritans and ye not. Who are the Samaritans? Samaritans were Jews, but they weren't keeping the law. They were what we call monophic or hypocrites, bordering on unbelief. So Jesus said, even though they are Jews, calling themselves Jews and so forth, don't even bother with them because they got too many problems in their belief system. So don't even deal with them Jews, them half-baked ones. But go ye rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when you go... There's nothing to teach. Don't teach nobody nothing. There's no teaching. Don't take no books and stuff like this. You don't need that. You're not going to set up no seminars and workshops and classes. Don't go give no lectures and stuff. Just make an announcement like Paul Revere. The British are coming. Just make an announcement. What? The kingdom of God is at hand. That's all I'm telling you now. What? When you go preach and announce saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, man. It's time. Time is up. You know, you better turn to your, turn back to your right belief and get your act together. That's all I'm telling you. The kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus told him, you would not have gone over all the cities of, Samar of, of Palestine before the end has come anyway. So there's no great commission to the whole of the world. Now, our Christian brethren, what I told you I would talk to, talk to you about earlier, tell us that in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, that Jesus, now after his alleged death and resurrection, had now a greater authority. And so that there now he commissions his disciples to the whole of mankind. He says, all power is given to me. So now, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel 
and baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So what happened here? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded. And Lord, I'm with you to the end of the world. So what I found that this just works just nice, nicely, when Matthew 28, 19 is quoted, all you have to do is quote it backwards. Matthew 19, 28 solves the problem. Just happened to work out that way. So don't forget now, what happened in this end of Matthew's gospel? Because most Bible scholars now tell you that this is an editorial uh, 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 statement put on there. That the writers have put that, tacked that uh, uh, statement on the end of Matthew's gospel. Because what? Because there was no great commission taught by Jesus, only a limited commission. So they had to have that. How are you going to evangelize the Gentile world? Paul has started and it was seen to be successful, so they had to have scripture to support it. So they just stick it right on the end of there. Says, look, at the end of Matthew's gospel, there's some space there. So you got enough for a couple of verses. So look, just tack that right on there. <laughs> Stop. It didn't happen like that, I'm sure. So they put that great commission on there. It says, you know, Jesus didn't baptize anybody, and you know you have to be baptized to be saved. So put that on there, too, that he's got to baptize. And Jesus never taught the Trinity. So what are we going to do about this? Well, look, stick that there, too, man. Put all three of them there. Put the, the Great Commission there. Put the baptized in there. And put the Trinity right there. Nobody, who's going to pay that any mind? Nobody will know. So they put it there. They got their doctrine in on the end of Matthew. It wasn't there. So now just to show that it's wrong, First of all, the show that is wrong, right off the top, we don't have to go any further. I asked my Christian brother, I said, look, that great commission in Matthew 28, 19, where was Jesus when he issued that command? Where was he? They say, you know, man, he was in Galilee. It says right here. He was in Galilee. After the resurrection, he told his disciples, go, I'll go before you in Galilee. So he went to Galilee, and when they showed up, he gave them that command. I said, well, look, did you read what Luke came after Matthew? He's inspired by God. He claims to be more authoritative in his ability to organize and arrange things. He's a scholar. He says that, look, when Jesus rose from the dead after the resurrection, he never went to Galilee at all. He went to Jerusalem and there ascended within 24 hours. He never went to Galilee at all, so he never could have gave that commandment there. So now you argue with Luke about that. Meanwhile, to show that it's not right, right again within the book, within Matthew, we say Matthew 19, 28. There. Peter now wants to know. Everybody wants to get something for what they do. So Peter says, look. Then Peter answered and said unto him, Behold, we which have forsaken all and followed thee, what shall we have? What are we going to get on the day of judgment? Now, you know, we used to be fishermen. We was making our business and all that, and then we got nothing. And we're following you. What's going to be this? And, and, you know, because we're going to check you. What are you going to give us? So Jesus said, Unto them verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit where? Upon twelve thrones, judging who? The twelve tribes of Israel. That's all. You won't be judging the whole world. You're going to be on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's the end of time now. So who's going to judge the Gentiles? There's nothing for no Gentiles there. And don't forget that Mark, Mark was the oldest gospel, the first gospel to write. And he wrote about this great commission, so to say. But look what he says. He says, and Jesus said in Mark chapter uh, 16, verse 15, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, so what's so strange about that? So Mark wrote first, didn't he know about the Trinity formula? He didn't tell him baptize the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He forgot that part. It's the most crucial part. He forgot that. Now, Jehovah Witness brethren have gotten themselves in trouble because they teach against the Trinity. Everybody knows that. The Jehovah Witnesses, they write many books against the Trinity. Why? Because they know it's not in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. It's out. So they have followed all Bibles and taken it out of theirs. But Matthew 28, 19 is there, and they can't get around that. So I said, do you know your Bible teaches the Trinity? It teaches the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They say... I say, well, look, when you baptize, what formula do you baptize in? They say, we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit-directed organization. 
meaning the governing body downtown Brooklyn, they, because because they know that this is a Trinitarian doctrine. So they don't baptize. I said, well, this is what it says. It's baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They don't do it. They know it's there. They couldn't get rid of it. So they're stuck with it, but they don't use it. They don't apply themselves to it. So I said, Mark didn't mention it. It wasn't important, so he didn't mention it. He'd never heard of no Trinity. That's why. And baptizing, he didn't say nothing about baptizing anybody because the gospel writer says Jesus didn't baptize anybody. He says his disciples baptized, but he didn't baptize anybody. So there's a problem. We can go further with that argument, but we'll leave it at that for now. Finally, the last topic of discussion, we want to talk about briefly, in the little time we have remaining, Muhammad Salaam as foretold in the Bible. Is he mentioned there? And a good place I like to start uh, with there, many times when I speak to my uh, Israelite brothers, you know, we talk about great nations. You know, the only people in the Bible called a nation proper is the Ishmaelites and the Israelites. Everybody else is nations. You know, Gentiles are called nations, plural. Gentiles means plural. It's nations. No Gentile can be called a nation. You see, only two people designated as the sons of Abraham, Ishmael and Isaac, they're called nation properly. The Hebrew word is ummah, as in Arabic, ummah. It's a nation. So God has spoken, promised that he would bless, bless the uh, children of Israel, uh, Ishmael and bless the children of Isaac and make them a great nation. So I asked my Christian brother and my Jewish brother, and I said, well, what made them great? What made them great? What made the, Ishmael, the Israelites great? Well, they'll tell me in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 2, 6, 7, and 8. When you read it, it says, look, you shall not add unto my world, word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught of it. You shall keep my commandments, keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Keep therefore and do them. So this is your, is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statues and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who has God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things which we call upon for him? And what nation is there so great that has statues, meaning laws, and judgments so righteous as all this law, this Torah, which I set before thee this day? So according to here, it's not the wealth of an individual in terms of material possessions and, and manufacturing of, of things uh, and so forth that makes that nation great. It's the God giving them a divine law and they obeying that law. In the sight of God, this makes the person, uh, nation great. So here, Abraham prays to his son. This is where I start with this topic. It says, and Abraham said unto God, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 18, 19, and 20. And in verse 20, God answers his prayer. And he says, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. It's already happened. I will make him in the future, future fruitful and will multiply him in seed of thee. Twelve persons shall he beget, and I will make of him a great nation. So I said to my Jewish brother, I said, Well, you know, we know what made Isaac's descendants great, the Ishmael, Israelites. So didn't you use the same yardstick to measure the greatness of the Ishmaelites? What makes them great? So Allah tells us in the Quran. In the Quran, in chapter 21, verse 10, certainly we have revealed to you a book which will give you eminence, which will make you great, the book. Do, do you not then understand? And in the Quran, chapter 43, verses 43 and 44, so hold fast of that which we have revealed to thee, surely thou art on the right path. And surely it is a reminder for thee and thy people, and you will be, will be questioned. So we say simply that the revelation of the Quran and the uh, application, the, the Sirah, the uh, Risalah, the messengership of the Prophet uh, 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 Muhammad Sallam, as a guide to all of humanity, as an example for all mankind, the Quran is the final revelation, has made them great. And just to wrap it up quickly, Moses prayed and uh, uh, supplicated to God. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse uh, 18, where God says to Moses, I will raise you up a prophet from among your brethren, like unto me, and put my words in his mouth. Put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I should command them. This shall come to pass. The whosoever will not hearken to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of them. 
So we know that the Quran is only the, the only book in the world today professing it to be itself to be words of God put into the mouth of the pr prophet who brought it. Now, there's many arguments we can show, and we have these arguments on videotape. In the future, if anyone would like to go further into the topic, I don't have the time now. I'm being flashed a five-minute warning here, so <laughs> I'm running out of time. But now Jesus finally made a prophecy also. Jesus says in, in John chapter 16, verses 7, uh, 7, 12, 13, and 14, a great prophecy co comparable to that that Moses made. He says, Jesus tells his disciples, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. It means Jesus didn't bring all truth. He didn't bring all truth. He brought the truth as he was able to give to his disciples, not all truth. He says, I have met yet many things to say unto you, but you're not able to bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. But he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Now, our Christian brethren tell us that that was the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. We said, no. Why? Because you got the wrong book now. You're the one book uh, behind. You go back to Luke. This is your prophecy. Luke chapter 24, verse 49, where Luke has the Jesus make a prophecy there to his disciples when he rose there. He's told them, carry you here in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Stay here. Don't go nowhere. So 10 days or so later, the day of Pentecost came and the the Holy Ghost, they tell us in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, descended on the apostles and began, they began to speak what they call glossolalia, or speaking in tongues. And that was the day of the Pentecost, which Luke in Acts chapter uh, 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 2 says was a prophecy fulfilling the day of the prophecy of Joel. Joel. So now John, who gave this prophecy about he, the spirit of truth, is not talking about the day of Pentecost. He knows nothing of that. In John chapter 20, verse 17, he has Jesus said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Take it right now while you're here. I have to wrap it up now. So if you'd like to ask me questions about that, I can continue. Subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yusifum. Wa salamun ala muslim. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Questions, please. We'll take your questions. Yes. My name is Dorman Sorbet. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know what Jesus actually Was he actually born? We have no reason to doubt that he was born 2,000 years ago. Yeah, we have no reason to doubt that. He was an historical person, and there are historians such as people named Josephus Philatheus and uh, Philo and other people who have documented things about him, be it true or false, but they did write about an individual named Jesus who was born 2,000 years ago. That fits the description, so we have no reason to doubt that. We believe that he was born a physical human person who actually lived. We can't pinpoint the actual date of his birth, but we, that's fair to say. Uh, I just want to ask a question in regards to the birth of Isa, Jesus. Um, uh, well, if he was a flesh and blood human being, how could he could be conceived without the understanding aid of a man? This is one of the questions. Well, according to uh, according to the Bible, in you know the first place that Jesus' birth is portrayed or conveyed in the Bible is not in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or in the accounts that Matthew give or Luke give. The first place that you hear about Jesus' birth in the Bible in the New Testament is from Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 3. So this is a problem that Christendom has to come to grips with. In Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Paul is the first person to speak about the nativity of Jesus, peace be upon him. And here he says in Romans chapter 3, chapter 1, verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, 
according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. So what Paul is saying here is that Jesus, according to his understanding, which is the first account, gospel account, was born of the seed of David. The Greek word, uh, David, the Greek word there for seed is spermatos, spermatos, where you get the word sperm. He said he's born of David's sperm according to the flesh, meaning by sexual relationships. That's what Paul says. How did he get to be the son of God? He's only declared that by having rose from the dead, being a resurrected person, which was Jesus' statement we told you earlier in Luke chapter 20, where he says, the three people uh, who were resurrected are sons of, the resur sons of God being sons of the resurrection. Again, where did Matthew uh, get the idea in the gospel, in the gospel, this is a Christian problem they have to come to grips with, that Jesus was born of a virgin. He got it from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, which there in the Greek text says, Behold a virgin, the Greek word is parthenos, where you get the word parthenogenesis from. A virgin shall be with child and bring forth a son. However, that statement was not given in Greek. It was given in Hebrew, and the Hebrew word there is alma. Alma does not proper, properly mean virgin. It means a young woman of marriageable age. Had the writer wanted to say virgin, he would have used the word another Hebrew word, which denotes that, which is Bethula. And so now Matthew, the writer, took that verse there and now said all this was done so that that prophecy could be fulfilled. However, both him and Luke go on to give a genealogy of Jesus, tracing his genealogy through Joseph to uh, uh, David. So... Uh, this is a problem that Christendom has about the virgin birth, according to their book. Don't forget this. There's two different concepts among the Christians. The Catholics don't use the term virgin birth. They use the term immaculate conception. They know that all birth is the same. Everybody's born the same way, unless you're born like some of the old mythologies out the ear of a person. A person is born out of somebody's ear. That would be a miraculous birth. They don't use virgin birth. They use the term immaculate conception. Only the Protestants use the term virgin birth. I hope that helps you a little bit. If I can remember reading in the Bible, they did say something about Mary said, so I believe it was the angel Gabriel or Jibril, you understand, said, how could I, I be... Have a son? How can I have a son when no man has touched me? Is that yes, what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm saying to you now, this is Matthew's story, but he's built the whole story based on a mistranslation of an, a passage in Isaiah. So you're saying that Esau or Jesus' birth was a normal birth just like anybody else? No, I'm else. saying according to the Bible okay. that it was. According to the Bible that they have this doctrine, a confused doctrine in the Bible. This is the Christian problem. We as Muslims, we don't have that problem. Right. Hello. I have uh, two questions for you, uh, Brother Hamza, from a member of the audience. Mm -hmm. The first one being, uh, they would like you to explain, uh, when you pray to God, is it necessary to pray to God through Jesus, or should you pray to God directly? And uh, the second question is, uh, in the Bible, there's a gap in the uh, history of Jesus. Uh, what was Jesus doing between his younger age and when he got older? As to the first question, should you pray to God directly or pray through Jesus? Don't forget that Jesus, peace be upon him, when he came to his apostles, had stayed with them, from, with them for some time and had not taught them how to pray at all. Uh, they came and requested of him, according to the gospel writings, Master, teach us to pray the way that John taught his disciples how to pray. So Jesus taught them. He says, oh, you're interested in praying in a particular way? So pray like this. When you pray, pray like this. Don't make yourself in public. First of all, he says not to be in public. Go somewhere private. Don't make a show or spectacle of yourself. 
we as Muslims, we say in the Masajid al-Allah, the whole earth is a place of prostration and worship. So our situation is different. But they were to go somewhere secluded. And to pray when you pray like this, Our Father, yours and mine, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's your will that we want to be done, not ours. We want to surrender our will to your will. On earth, as it's being done on heaven, the will of God is being done. That's is Islam. Islam means surrender to the will of God. So these people are wanting to surrender to the will of God the same way nature and creation does. It's already been done. Our will be done. Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Then that's the part for God, just like we have in the Fatiha. Half of the Fatiha is dedicated towards the magnification of Allah. All praises are due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the, the beneficent, the merciful, master of the day of requital of judgment. Thee do we worship, and thee alone we beseech for help. Then for us we say, give us this day our, uh, 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 stuff uh, guide, uh, uh, guide us on the straight path, the path of those whom thou have bestowed favor, not the path of those who go astray or those who wrath. So the same thing with the Lord's Prayer, as it's called. The first half is dedicated to the magnification of God. The second part is dedicated to the human need. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin. That's directly to God. It's got nothing to do with praying to Jesus at all. That prayer was to God. That prayer was to God. Now, there are some situations where it says that, you remember that Paul, we quoted earlier, Paul said that I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not to Jesus, it's got nothing to do with him. But there are some statements that imply that whatever you ask in Jesus' name, then it will be given. So I would si simply su suggest to you that perhaps this would be what we call dua, or uh, supplication, not what we call uh, uh, salah or worship. Worship properly is for God. Supplication, a person can supplicate, and people supplicate in the name of many peoples, not to say that it's correct, but Jesus now taught that you can approach God directly. No intercession, no one's name needed. Now, as to the second question about what was uh, happening or what was Jesus doing prior to the accounts we have in the gospel? Well, the first ac account that we get in the gospel about Jesus is from Mark, Mark's account. And Mark picks up the life of Jesus. He's not interested and he seems to have no knowledge about Jesus. Uh, as Jesus is a grown man coming to be baptized by John the Baptist. However, there are other writers who speak of Jesus when he was a young person. Maybe uh, first we have him when he's eight days old, he's being brought to the temple. And then after that, he disappears from any historical account. Then he comes back into view when he's around 12 and he's in the synagogue. And he's sitting with the people, asking questions and so forth. It says one day he was sitting in the, uh, in the synagogue and somebody came and says, look, your mother and your, behold, your mother and your brethren are outside. They're looking for you. And he looks around and he says, who is my mother and who is my brother? Behold, my mothers and my brethren. For whosoever does the will of God, submission to the will of God, which is a Muslim, whoever does the will of God, the same is my brother and my, my, and my mother and my sister. These are our connections here. Doing the will of God is one ummah based on worship of God. So the writers don't give any account of what happened in the interim between those years. Evidently, they don't know. So would you say maybe those accounts uh, have been lost in the books or the many accounts that Luke spoke about? Uh, a lot of those best, they're not given, so no need to speculate or conjecture about them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. So my name is Brother Fareed. I just, um, you know, I really don't have no problem with understanding of the, the Quran, the interpretation of the Immaculate conception that is given in the Quran mm -hmm. and the Bible. Mm -hmm. And just for a point of information, mm -hmm. I would like to know what is your um, and this, you know interpretation of the what the Quran what the Quran says about the you know the interpretation the English translation of the interpretation of what the Quran says about the likeness of Jesus is just as the likeness of Adam. Allah said to 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 Jesus be and he, Adam be and he was and the same thing is said about Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, point of information I would like to know. You know. Uh, well, you speak about the translations and so forth. If you read it, Allah says, "Surely the likeness of Jesus with the law is the likeness of Adam." Uh, he created him from dust and said to him, "What kun fire kun be and he was." It's very simple. Thank you very much, brother.
My name is Abdul Karim Akbar. Uh, you mentioned about Paul and on the road to Damascus. Mm -hmm. uh, now, everybody that speaks to me about Paul, they always use the term or the terminology, the Apostle Paul. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, while you were talking, you mentioned something about apostles and disciples and so forth. Mm -hmm. Was Paul an apostle? And was he also uh, rewarded? Like uh, you said that the apostles asked Jesus, uh, what will be our reward? Mm -hmm. So was Paul actually an apostle and was he, you know, rewarded with the others? Okay, good question. Uh, and all of the questions have been good questions. Let me see if we can answer this right out of the text. You want to know if Paul was a legitimate apostle, I assume this is what you're asking. Well, according to Luke, he wasn't. According to Luke, Paul was not did not meet the qualifications to be called an apostle. Look what Luke says. You know, uh, Paul made himself an apostle. He just declared himself an apostle. But Luke, you know, Jesus had chose 12 apostles, and he named them himself 12 apostles, and nobody had the right to declare themselves to be an apostle. Jesus himself chose them, and he named them apostles, and he designated them one to each tribe uh, 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 to as an uh, embassy, emissary. So now when Judas committed suicide, according to the gospel accounts, they carried that on over into the book of Acts with only 11 apostles. So that therefore now the work that was uh, assigned needed another candidate to be an apostle. So how could they get them, get that apostle? They don't just go and like we have today, the guy gets up on a soapbox and uh, uh, makes a banner and elects himself as, a, as an apostle and people vote for him. No. This has to be somewhat divinely appointed. It has to be some high authority. So look, Luke says here, how, what is the qualification for an apostle? In Acts chapter 2, verse 21. He says, wherefore of these men which have campaigned, companied rather, with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. We have to choose somebody who had been with us from the time that Jesus was with us. Beginning from the baptism of John, the baptism of John, up until the same day that he, meaning Jesus, was taken from us, must one be ordained to witness with us uh, of his resurrection? So now Paul, uh, Luke is saying that to choose somebody, that person has to be somebody who's familiar with us, who was with us from the time that John baptized Jesus, was with us and know our ins and outs until the time that Jesus was resurrected and ascended into heaven. We have to get somebody who knows the movement like that, so we have to get that person. So, verse 23 says, and they appointed to, uh, uh, and they appointed to uh, Joseph and Bathsheba, let's see, no, 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 no. and they pointed to Joseph called Bathsheba, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias, and they prayed and said, Lord, thy, thy, thou Lord, which knoweth the hearts of men, show whether of these two thou have chosen. So they took two names of people who met that qualification, and then they prayed, because this had to have God's hand involved in it. So before Jesus just chose them, he had the qualification. Jesus is not here. You don't have that qualification, so pray and ask God to help you with this. So they prayed and asked God to choose one of these two names that met that qualification. It says in verse 35, that that person may, talk, may take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas the transgressor fell, that he might go his own way. And they gave forth their lots, they put their lots out, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So they chose by some kind of divine lot taking, you see. They had two names meeting the qualification. They prayed to God. And the lot fell on Matthias, and so Matthias was called the 12. Don't forget that the apostles were called 12 up, and up until the time that, that uh, Judas committed suicide. Then the language in the, in the gospel changes. Now they're called the 11. Once Matthias is chosen in the book of Acts, they are called the 12 again. 
the 12 again. So Paul is not counted there. And later in the book of Revelation, in book 20, and uh, chapter 24, verse 14, they speak there about the kingdom of Jerusalem being shown to uh, John, John the Revelator on the island of Patmos. And they tell about the kingdom that has 12 gates and 12 foundations and 12 names, and the names of the 12 apostles are there. Paul's name is not there. He's never included, never at all. He was never included in the apostles of Jesus. He made himself that. And there's contradictory stories in the book of Acts, chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26. This is where you read his account on the Damascus Road. Each account contradicts itself over and over again. Don't forget also one other point to that is that Peter himself claimed that he was an apostle to the Gentiles. Peter claimed that God had made him an apostle to the Gentiles, and him and Paul had a big schism about that. Paul said, no, it made Jesus, Peter said it him. Isn't that strange that if Jesus had told all the apostles on, on, in Acts chapter 28, verse 19, go ye into the world and preach the gospel, they all should have went to the Gentiles. You don't need Paul. Everybody was to do it. So it's a fabrication. Yeah, sorry. Assalamu alaikum. Wa well, alaikum. Uh, in the Ansaru Allah account uh, concerning the crucifixion of Jesus, mm -hmm. it was stated that uh, Judas was the one that was on the cross who said, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken thee? Yeah. And uh, I would like to know, is that consistent with your further knowledge about the crucifixion? Yeah, well, this is called the doctrine or the theory of substitution, theory of substitution. And that theory started right in the gospel, as a matter of fact. Uh, let me see if I can find it, if you got a minute. Uh, I'm going to turn it up the right way so I can read it. Uh, this theory is called the theory of substitution. Can you find it there where Cyrene was carrying his uh, cross there, Professor? Okay, let's take a look right here. In Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27, verse 32. Look what it says there. Matthew 27, 32. When Jesus is supposed to be gone to uh, the place of crucifixion, Golgotha, I think the hill, and he was carrying his cross. It says there, and as they came out, of the, uh, out, out from the city, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled him to bear his cross. They say that Jesus, he had been scourged and whipped so much, he was kind of beat down, and he was carrying this big beam on his shoulder. So he's almost to collapse. And as on the way, they see this guy, uh, uh, Simon. So they said, look, get that guy there and let him carry this thing for him on up the hill. So now that led to the theory of substitution. They think that when he got there, they just put him up on the cross and killed him. This is an agnostic uh, uh, heresy, they call it. Right, right. So to clear this up, the, the writer of John changes this statement around. Look what he says. He says, and going on to that place, and he, Jesus, bearing his own cross, went forth to a place called the place of the skull, which is called the, in the Hebrew Golgotha. You see, he makes it clear that no, Jesus carried his own cross. So we get rid of that theory of substitution. So the one that carried, he's the one that got there with it, and he was there. So no, there's no theory of substitution. And when Allah speaks in the Quran about, well, like a shubihala whom, the term shubiha, from what I have been able to investigate, talks about the, the doubt, uh, uh, the thing that appeared to be crucified is the, the one talked about, not someone else. Not someone else was made to appear like him, but the one talked about was made to appear as one crucified, the thing talked about. So therefore, it, it, it implies that Jesus, if he had went through that ordain, ordeal, he was made to look like one crucified. He looked that way, but was not dead. So if they took him down, they assumed that, that and they were in doubt about it. One thing out there is conjecture, and he wasn't dead. This is the point. I hope that helps you a little bit with that. But Thank the you. theory started in the Bible here of substitution, and there's nothing to support that anyone else was killed in Jesus' place. Thank you.
Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. Um, my question is, uh, I have two questions, mm -hmm. inshallah. My first question is whether or not Peter and Barnabas, are they the same person? No. They're two different people? Yeah. They were people, Barnabas was a companion of Paul who traveled with him. As a matter of fact, he helped get Paul in the door, in the door to meet with Peter and James and these uh, uh, apostles. And then later on, him and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas had some problem. And so they ended up falling out, getting into some schism and going their separate ways. So, uh, they're, no, they're different people all together. Alhamdulillah. My second question is uh, a question in regards to Yaqeen. Um, I take it from your talk that you can use and utilize the traditions of the Jew and the um, Christian when trying to... Um, encourage a person uh, sense of yakin or just to, to one side or the other well yakin means certainty it's right right so if you use if you're saying can is it proper to use a methodology in dawa i assume this is what you're talking about right of relating to the book of the people you're talking to in order to convince them right well this is what i've been doing all exactly. evening i don't see any problem with that you see, what we as Muslims are told and cautioned and warned, not, we, don't, we don't follow any revelation, only the Qur'an. Allah tells us uh, uh, the only uh, book in the Qur'an Allah says to follow is the Qur'an. The only messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has uh, mentioned, that he's told us to follow is the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. We are to believe in all the messengers and all the books, but follow the last messenger and follow the last Qur'an. However... Allah tells us that the Christians and the Jews will say, that the Christians and Jews will say to us that no people can go to paradise except they be Jews and Christians. Exactly. Allah says, Tilka, Tilka, Amanihum. Say to them, uh, uh, where is your evidence for what you say? Mm -hmm. So this is what Allah has told us when, and we hear this every day, mm -hmm. to ask them for the evidence. Now, why would Allah ask you to ask for evidence if you're not able to examine it and check it out and see what mm -hmm. it is? You have to know something about it. And our good brother, uh, Dr. Ismail Faruqi, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, who died, was murdered. He had... Uh, made a statement once in a telecast that he had, he pointed out that Islam being the youngest of the religions in the Abrahamic stream, we know that Islam is the only religion from Allah, mm -hmm. but since people look at it in terms of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, so Islam being the youngest in that stream mm -hmm. had to criticize certain things about Judaism and Christianity. Mm -hmm. It criticizes that. So that therefore the Muslims should know the meaning of those criticisms. You mm -hmm. can't say that, uh, you know, your book is not the word of God. And then the person said, well, can you show me? Mm -hmm. uh, Allah says in the Quran, Allah says, those who follow the messenger prophet, the Ummi, whom they find mentioned, he's there now mentioned in the Torah and the Injil. Mm -hmm. And the Christian says, well, you know, like one asked me, a gentleman named Jack Evans in Texas, he asked me, Mr. Malik, he says, you know, your book says that those who follow the messenger, the one who's <laughs> mentioned, said, where is he mentioned, sir, in my book? Hmm. So we have to show him, you know, in the book of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, Solomon 5, 16, the name Muhammad is there. The name Muhammad, Muhammad Dim, is there. And now what has happened, they have translated the meaning of his name, he's altogether lovely, where this is a novelty that you never translate the meaning of a person's name. Yeah. When it says his name is Emmanuel, they say Emmanuel, and what does it mean? God with us. They get the name and the meaning. But here they say that name is Muhammad. We can't mention that. Just tell what it means. Mm -hmm. He's altogether lovely. So we have to be able to show things like that. It's very simple. Not only that, Allah he says he has made the revelation to have connection so that the people might be guided. Inshallah. We got a tape on that, by the way, uh, Introduction to the Study of Comparative Religion as a tool for Dao. It's not the tool, it's a tool for Dao. If you can get that, it'll help you a lot. Inshallah. Mm -hmm. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Hi. Um, I was brought up as a Christian, and I just wanted to know if did Jesus really die at the age of 33, or did he live to be older? 
Uh, that would be conjecture on my part, and so I'm not able to answer that. Uh, no, nobody knows that for sure. And so when Jesus uh, died, if he ever died or not, nobody knows that for sure. Okay. Whether he died or not in terms of your Christian doctrine. Nobody knows that at all. What date he died, we say he never died. And you were brought up as a Christian, mm -hmm. but you weren't born that way. You were, you were born as a Muslim. And don't forget that Jesus wasn't a Christian. You know that he never heard that term Christianity or Christian in his life. It was used after him, and it was a nickname given to his followers. His religion was total submission to the will of God, which is called in Arabic Islam. And that's what you should be. Okay, thank you. So, and you have an opportunity tonight, if you would like, to become a Muslim. We invite you. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. I used to study a Christian faith. And, uh, I can't hear you too well. I used to study the Christian faith. Yeah. I can't remember exactly where it is, but I believe that somewhere uh, close to Revelations, there's a verse that says, uh, every knee shall bow. Yeah. I believe in one faith or one yeah. church. Yeah. Um, in your observation, in your studies, can you find any evidence to point to say that this is actually pointing at Islam? To uh, say one faith, every knee shall bow in one faith. Well, there's nothing to say that's not pointing that way if that's there, but we can show many other very clear things that point to Islam. The mere fact that we said that the prophet that Jesus foretold to come after him was, we say, Muhammad, who brought the revelation of the Quran and the, established the complete uh, identity of this religion, Islam. He completed this religion, so we can point to many other things. This would be something as an allegory or metaphor that we could try to interpret that way, but we don't need to bother with that. We have too many more concrete things to deal with. Uh, I have a question, but inside uh, my question, they have the answer. No. Uh, it's uh, like joking. Uh, MashaAllah, we heard all the time people, they say Jesus is son of God. Mm -hmm. Why God, he got son? Why mm -hmm. he doesn't have dua? Yeah, MashaAllah. <laughs> or why is uh, God, he doesn't have too many sons, he has only one son. Mm -hmm. That's what all the time we have heard this, this in uh, people, they say Jesus is son of God. Mm -hmm. Another thing, they say Jesus he, he gets killed. How come the God he, he gets killed? And this life we see every day, kids and uh, too many generations, how come the God he, he die and this thing is still life? Can be true. Huh? Yeah. That's fun. So again, we say that even the Bible, the Old Testament speaks about the daughters of God in that sense. We said that no, Allah says he begets not nor is he begotten. And then Allah says, how can he have a son when he has no mate? He tells you that. He asks you the question. He answers you. He says, he's the wonderful originator in Quran chapter 6 verse 101. He's the originator of the heavens and earth. He asks you, the intelligent mind, how can he have a son when he doesn't have a mate? He asks you that in the Quran. He asks you, but he answers it for you like you just said now. Yeah. Because we are all children yeah. of uh, God. You know? Well, we don't use that language. We as Muslims, we don't use the term. The term, there's no term Abba as an attribute of Allah. Mm -hmm. The term is Rab, meaning that we, uh, he is our nourisher, and we are Abdul, our yeah, slaves yeah. and servants. Yeah, we're not children. And as to God dying, we know that this... Uh, uh, is a Christian concept. It's nothing to do with Islam, and we prove tonight that God has not died. Yeah. That Jesus is not God, and He's not died for anybody's sin. So this is just something that needs a little deeper thinking yeah. on the part of those who hold that view. For them, they see Jesus is God. Yeah. How come God is gonna die? And uh, this thing uh, we see yeah. now in life, we see bird, we see animal. Everything yeah. is on the light. Yeah, it's illogical, so it, it just doesn't make sense. And I think we've dealt with not some... Not even one second uh, can be a mistake, you know. Yeah. Mashallah. Because God, he can sleep, he can... Uh, if right. it's one second, uh, everything is going to... Uh, exactly. 
God doesn't sleep or do any of that. Don't forget that even in the, uh, even in the uh, Ten Commandments, they say that, God, look, why do you keep the Sabbath day holy? So one version in Deuteronomy, I believe it is, or Exodus, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why? Because the God created the heaven and earth in six days and rested on the seventh. But in Isaiah 40, it says that God never sleeps and slumbers and doesn't rest. So now they had to change that. So the next set of commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5, around verse 8, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It says, why? It says, because when you was in bondage in Egypt and God brought you out by, the, by a mighty hand, for that cause you keep the Sabbath day. Never mind rest, and we change that now. Because we freed you from slavery. So we see it's just inconsistent throughout, throughout the Bible, throughout the yeah, book. One just has to look, very simply. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we, not because we're anybody, we're not anybody. It's just because the truth, the truth of the matter stands on its own two feet, you see? And so that therefore we can present this argument to the most high, highest of the learned people in society. They can't deal with this. The truth stands and falsehood has to perish. Not because we are anybody. It's just the truth. Yeah. Sure, up. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, brother, I would like for you to elaborate on um, why and where was the lie born about the racial identity of Jesus and the Hebrews and why it's still today it's such a, a well kept secret about the Hebrews and the color of the race of Jesus and the prophets. Uh, I didn't get you clearly. Are you saying where did the lie yeah, begin well, you know, about? The race of Jesus, what right, the racial identity. When was you know like the pictures start being portrayed as, um, as white, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Someone told me uh, the drawings of Michelangelo or somebody. Yeah, it's possible uh, that this happened back mm -hmm. in that time in, mm -hmm. uh, in the early centuries of Christendom. Mm -hmm. But again, this is something I don't really deal with too much. I'm not that concerned about mm -hmm. issues of that nature. Mm -hmm. You see, this. this I'm just saying now, okay. to, I can't answer your question specifically, mm -hmm. so I'll just be conjecture. Right, I mean, right. there's some history about paintings in terms of mm -hmm. these pictorials of Jesus as blue-eyed and blonde hair and all that, and trying to ascribe that to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of a more broader uh, concept that mm -hmm. a lot of our Israelite brothers in particular right. mm -hmm. like to argue that Jesus was black or Jesus was not, mm -hmm. said, we say that this is just a, a, another uh, 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 mis, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, misguided concept that people are holding. You see, now people are coming, running out. They're running out of space in terms of Jesus being God and Jesus being the Son of God and Jesus died for people's sins. So now they need something else to push before the people because the people are going to run away from that. So many of the churches now have got pictures of Jesus that are black pictures of Jesus. You figure, well, this is something you can identify. Stay, Jesus is black like you. I'm saying, no, we're not interested in what color Jesus was. Who knows for sure? Nobody knows for sure. We can speculate and all that conjecture. The point is, Jesus has got nothing to do with nobody today. In this year, this day, Jesus has nothing to do with nobody. His mission was 2,000 years ago to the Israelite people, whoever they were, and it's gone. It's not even today. Even the Israelites today have to be Muslims. Everybody has to be Muslims today. Right, right. You see? Okay. This is the point. Right. I understand that, but... It, I, I think it's, it's good, you know, for our black children, you know, to have something to identify with because when we always open books, the, the pictures always portrayed the great people as white. And I have to address this issue. It needs addressing because 2,000 years from now, if somebody sees a picture of Elvis Presley and Elvis Presley is black, the white race ain't going to like that. You well, know, when a Muslim saying, takes it, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. It doesn't when a make Muslim, a difference. When a Muslim becomes a Muslim, mm -hmm. he bears witness. He says, mm -hmm. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worthy of adoration right. of mm -hmm. worship except Allah. Wa ashadu anna Muhammad or Rasulullah. Muhammad is the example of mankind. So this is what we need to give our children mm -hmm. to, uh, to admire. And this will make the best of conduct as what we see now. You see, now if somebody feels they need that, then they can have that. It's no problem. True. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, according to the scriptures, according to the Bible, yeah. Uh, when Jesus met with John the Baptist, yeah. Being that they both were recognized as prophets, yeah. Why didn't John then follow Jesus 
as a prophet and as the next messenger of Allah to lead him. And why then term that he just going, he was baptized and went on about his business and did not follow Jesus, knowing that he was the Messiah based on the scripture? Well, that's a good question. And you might ask, you might ask, why didn't Jesus follow John? When Jesus came to, G, to John the Baptist, since Jesus, uh, John was on, uh, on the scene there, they were contemporaries, and Jesus uh, came to him to be baptized. Many people would say, well, because Jesus had some problems. You see, because Jesus, the people tell us that Jesus was without sin. Well, we believe that Jesus was without sin, but we know that the Arabic term sin is dan, dan. It means sin, proper, shortcomings, and faults. So we know that everybody has shortcomings and faults. But they, we know that the prophets did not sin, like adultery, fornication, lying, stealing, and all that. But they had shortcomings and faults, like the time of the Prophet Sallallahu in the Quran, where he's discussing with someone of notoriety, and someone that has not such great notoriety came to him to question him about something, to ask something, and he kind of ignored the person, and the law chided him about that. That was a fault of his. Or when he told the people how to prune their date palms, and then they didn't have any good crops that year. That was a human fault. That covers under the, the term dan. But sins, he, they didn't have. So we say that Jesus had some faults as well that perhaps he felt, according to the Bible uh, uh, definition, that, Jesus, that John was baptizing people for remission of sins. So Jesus came to him for that. And so, therefore, we ask, why didn't Jesus now follow John until John's prophecy was up? Or, good point, like you brought, since the Messiah is here now, why didn't John follow him? So, we say that John, the gospel tells us in the, the, the book of John, that when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming according to their reference here, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of man. John recognizes him. And says also that the one coming after me, that his shoe latches, I'm not even worthy to, to untie. Yet, later on, when John is in prison, and uh, uh, the disciples come to him, telling them about the things that Jesus are doing, is doing now. He says, look, this guy, you remember that you baptized? Look what he's doing. So he says, look, go and ask him, is he the one to come, or should we look for another? So this is contradicting. Does John know who he is? He doesn't know. Before he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins. Now he's asking, Are you the one to come or should we look for another? I'm not sure. So this is a whole contradictory thing here in the, in the Bible there. Why didn't Jesus follow John? Why didn't John follow Jesus? I, don't, I could go into it further, but I don't have the time. It's a good question. It's a fair question to ask. We don't know. <laughs> That's all. Well, let me just close with a reminder from the Quran here. If there's no more questions. Oh, yes, you have a question. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum uh, salam. What was the, um, the Jewish form of capital punishment, you know, for blaspheming and, you know, for breaking the laws or the commandments? Were they, um, as you said, uh, crucified and hung on the cross? You know, when they broke the commandments, but what was the, you know, what Bible said about that? Good question. Well, you, and, and it's one of my students here, and he's helped me out a lot with that question because it gives me a chance to reopen something <laughs> that should have been dealt with. <laughs> the capital punishment for blasphemy, according to Jewish law, is stoning to death. Stoning to death. And this is exactly what Paul claimed happened to Jesus, mm -hmm. how Jesus died. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, Paul says that Jesus. Uh, had been stoned to death because he had blasphemed. That the Jews had claimed them that you know you being a, a, a man making yourself God, so you blaspheme. Mm -hmm. So Paul in Galatians chapter three verse thirteen, mm -hmm. Galatians three thirteen says, "Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us. For it is written, curses is everyone that hangs on a tree." Mm -hmm. So we ask Paul, says, "Excuse me, where is it written?" He says, well, it's written in Deuteronomy chapter 21, around verse 20. If a man have a son, and the son is disobedient and all that, and he has to be put to death, you kill him, and you hang him in a tree. 
but you have to take him down before before nightfall because his body should not stay all day because cursed is 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 the the person that hangs on a tree. So Paul is saying that Jesus now fits that bill that he has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written curses everyone to hang on a tree. Now there's nothing in the gospel accounts of trees of Jesus hanging on a tree. There's no curses given for hanging on crosses. Mm -hmm. It's only from there. And that person that was hung on the tree is a corpse. It's not a live person hung there to die. It's the person dead and then put up there as a corpse. So Paul got himself caught with that situation there, attributing that to Jesus, that Jesus had redeemed it from that. So we asked the question, where is it written? It says it's in Deuteronomy. Don't forget that the reason for taking the body down off the cross in the gospel accounts with crucifixion is because the Sabbath day was coming. They said because it was the high day and the, the Sabbath day, they had to get the body down. That's not the law that Paul was talking about. The body could have stayed there forever. It's just that the law says when you hang a corpse up, he's dead. You have to take that corpse down before sunset. Other than that, crucifixion doesn't matter. If it's not the Sabbath day, say it was a Monday, then he hangs there until Friday. Doesn't matter because crucifixion is supposed to be a slow lingering death. So there's two different reasons for taking the body down and two different reasons for methodology. One for killing a person, dead corpse, take him down. One for crucifixion, take him down only because it's the Sabbath day. I hope that help, helps you a little bit. It helped me out a little bit. So it's just about time. Okay, let me just close uh, with uh, a couple of verses here. I want to thank the people again for taking the time, and I don't want to tax people too long here. Just a reminder, some verses from the Quran here, that Allah says there in the Quran, that they do blaspheme, who say that Allah is Christ, the son of Mary. But Christ said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord, and your Lord. Whosoever joins gods with Allah, Allah will forbid for him the garden and the fire, and hell will be his abode. There will, uh, there will, be, uh, there will be for the wrongdoers uh, no helper. They do blaspheme, who say that Allah is one of three in a trinity, for there is no God except Allah, if they decease not, from their word of blasphemy, verily a grievous penalty will befall the blasphemers among them. Why turn they not to Allah and seek his forgiveness? For Allah is often forgiven, most merciful. Christ the son of Mary was no more than an apostle. Many were the apostles that passed away before him. Say, we will worship besides Allah. Will you worship besides Allah something which has no power either to harm or benefit you, but Allah, he is the hearer and the knower of all things. Say, O people of the book, exceed not the religion, your religion, uh, uh, exceed not the bounds in your religion, uh, nor trespass beyond the truth, trespass beyond the truth, nor follow the vain desires of the people who went wrong before, in times gone by, who misled many and strayed themselves from the way. And in the book of Zephaniah, to leave you with this statement, there it says, for then prophecy. Will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent? And this is a, to me, reminds me of what happens on the Hajj. When you see a pure language, Allah says he has revealed this Quran, a pure Arabic language. And in the, in the Hajj, we say, Labek Allahumma Labek, Labek Allah Sharika, Laka Labek. And Alhamna wa Ni'amata laka wa muq la sharikala. We call it Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. We're all people from all nationalities, from all parts of the world. Once every year, three, four million people gathered together. Only spectacle like that on the earth for the last 1400 years and growing. All people calling on the name of the, of the Lord with one consent. Don't forget, a Muslim can go anywhere in the world and pray with his brother, and everybody knows the language of prayer. If I pray with a Greek, with a Chinese, with a Russian, with an African, with an Italian, whoever, we all say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. If anybody says anything wrong, anybody can correct them. It's not so with any other religion. A person who only knows Christian, uh, uh, English cannot uh, pray with a person who's speaking Arabic. So therefore, this calling on God with one consent seems to me a future a prophecy about the coming of Islam. And finally, I want to say that previous beliefs and opinions should never permit, be permitted to hinder uh, one in receiving and considering a statement of fact. This to me seems to be a principle worthwhile to follow. Again, I thank you all and I thank 
uh, everyone who sponsored this program, who had any hand in it, the people who have been patient with us for coming out. We invite you to uh, seek more information about Islam, to uh, look into the local masjids in your community and so forth. And we thank you again. Jazakallah khair. Allah be pleased with all of us, you and me, and forgive me for any mistakes that I've made. Shukran.